Hi everyone. In this Connect with Networking video, we're going to discuss Chapter 5, the network and transport layers of the network model. Let's go ahead and get started. The network and transport layers are layer 3 and 4 in the internet model, and they reside just below the application layer and above the data link layer. And they are responsible for how we decide traffic moves across a network. Specifically, the transport layer, or layer 4, is responsible for things like segmentation and reassembly, so taking large messages and breaking them out into smaller segments that can be broadcast across a network, and then reassembling them once they are received. Also responsible for session management, so establishing a connection between two devices, and then ending that communication once the transport of information is finished. Also responsible for end-to-end -end delivery of messages, so making sure the message gets from the application layer on one end to the appropriate application layer on the other end. The network layer is layer 3. It's responsible for addressing information, so how we get a message from a specific device to another specific device on another network. Also responsible for routing messages or deciding which path we're going to take to get a message from one place to another. TCP IP was originally developed back in 1974 by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn. These gentlemen developed TCP IP as a single inter-networking protocol that was later divided into TCP and IP to allow for a little more flexibility in the network stack. These are by far the most common protocols used on both the internet and local area networks and have started to become widely adopted in wide area networks and backbone networks. So this is the only set of protocols we will be discussing in detail in this class because they are so widely used across a variety of different networks. The transmission control protocol, which is the most common transport layer protocol, has a data unit called a segment. It is used for very reliable transmission of data and it uses something between 20 and 24 bytes of overhead, which include source and destination ports, the sequence number or which segment a particular segment is, an acknowledgement number, some header information, some flags, some flow control, and some error detection, in this case CRC16, and then a variable user length. There are still some alternative transport layer protocols that we use today, and one that is commonly used is the user datagram protocol. This operates at the transport layer, and its data unit is called a datagram. It's used in situations where the information is time sensitive, or we're sending simple control messages, or when we're not worried about reliability because that's being handled by the application layer. The overhead is much smaller in a UDP datagram. It's only 4 to 8 bytes. And the source port is potentially optional in both IPv4 and IPv6. Checksum is even optional in older IPv4 protocols. You have a homework exercise that explores both TCP and UDP where you can look a little bit harder at the differences between these two protocols. The internet protocol that most people are familiar with is IPv4 still the most commonly used version of internet protocol, and it's based upon 32-bit address space, which allows for approximately 4 billion possible addresses. When this protocol was originally developed, the idea of using up 4 billion addresses seemed, I'm sure, ludicrous to the inventors. But they, of course, did not imagine how widely used the internet would eventually become. There is a new version of internet protocol, IPv6, that expands the address space from 32 bits to 128. Keep in mind that every time you add a single bit to an address space, you're doubling the number of addresses. So had they gone from 32 to 33 bit addresses, they would have gone from 4 billion to 8 billion addresses. But they didn't just do that. They doubled and then doubled and then doubled and then doubled all the way up from 32 to 128 bits of address space, which means we have something like 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power possible addresses. This is a very, very large number of addresses 
and the likelihood that we will use them up in the foreseeable future is very low. Adoption of IPv6 has actually been fairly slow because of some mitigating technologies that have come along to allow us to continue to use IPv4 even though we're exhausting its address space. But eventually IPv6 will completely supplant IPv4. The older IPv4 packet also has 20 to 24 bytes of overhead similar to TCP. It has some information about the version, the header length, the type of service, the IDs, some flags, some protocols, some CRC. It has address, both source and destination, and it has a variable user length field. Most of the options fields are rarely used today, which is another reason why IPv6 was developed. So IPv6 has a larger header space. Instead of 20 to 24 bytes, it's 40 bytes of overhead, but it has information that is relevant to modern networks. It still has a source address and a destination address, but you can see they are both much larger, four times as many bits in both the source address and the destination address. There's less overhead in terms of versioning and flow control and those sorts of things, but it allows for managing fragmentation and authentication, encapsulation of security payloads, some various destination options, so there's a little more flexibility in terms of how the overhead bits are used, which lends this particular protocol to modern networks. The transport layer links the application layer to the network layer. And you're typically gonna see TCP being used, but occasionally you'll also see UDP being used to move information from that application layer down the stack. When we use transport layers, we're usually referring to ports which is a two byte number to identify where on a specific device a specific data unit is supposed to go. This is not the address space we're gonna see in the network layer. Ports are specific locations on an individual device. So for instance, your PC might expect to receive traffic for a web page via port 80 and would expect to receive secure web pages via port 443. If you're receiving email, you might receive it over port 25 using the old SMTP protocol. If you're using a newer email protocol, you might expect to receive your email via port 143 or 110. If you're making a simple DNS request, you might use port 53. Ports on computers are available to direct a packet to a specific location or a specific application. So these are more specific than the generic address that belongs to each individual device on a network. So think about individuals living inside a house. You have a street address, which is your address for the entire home, but then you could address a message to a specific individual living at that location so the packet goes to the exact individual that it pertains to. Here's what transport layer functions might look like. In this case, the client computer on the right could send information to a server asking for a file via FTP or email via port 25 or web server via port 80. So you can see in this first packet that they are sending a message to the IP address for the server, but to a specific port, in this case port 80, which is requesting a web page. And you can see that they have a source address, their own IP address, and the port they're using for their web browser. When the server responds, it will send back to the IP address for the specific device, but it will send back to the appropriate port. Now in this second packet, it looks like this particular server is sending information to port 1028, which is the client computer's email port. So this is a message that's coming from an email server and being sent to an email client. In the third packet, the client computer is sending information to a server specifically to port 554, which is a music server. So they're requesting some sort of music and they would receive information back on port 1029 for their music player. Transport layers are responsible for segmenting or breaking up large files into smaller segments. And then when they are received, putting them back together in the proper order. Segments can be passed individually to the application layer or after reassembly. So the transport layer might assemble all of the segments and then provide the complete file to the application layer 
or it might give that responsibility to the application layer itself. Segments can vary in size. The overall size of an Ethernet frame, which is the most common data link layer protocol used today, is 1500 bytes. We know from our earlier slides in this chapter that TCP has a overall header size of 20 to 24 bytes, and IPv4 also has a header size of 20 to 24 bytes. If we use the most efficient version of their header space, we would have to subtract 40 bytes for header space, which means the maximum size of data or segments at the transport layer is 1,460 bytes. It's typically going to be a little bit smaller than that, but this would be the maximum segment size that we can manage. Most files are a lot larger than 1.46 kilobytes. So we're going to have to break our files into multiple segments, send each segment individually, and then reassemble those segments once they are received. Pictorially, what are we talking about? Well, an application wants to send information to another computer. It's going to send that data to the transport layer, and the transport layer is going to break that information up into segments that fit the network layer and data link layers constraints. It will then add some header information. That information will be received by the network layer, which will add its own header information, in our case, IP. Those data units will be sent down to the data link layer, which also adds its own header information, in this case, Ethernet frame information. After being broadcast across the physical layer, we would disassemble these various data units back up the stack. So an Ethernet frame would be received and its header information would be removed. The information would be received by the network layer and the IP header information would be removed. The information would be received by the transport layer and those headers would be removed. And the information would potentially be reassembled at the transport layer. And then the reassembled packet would be received by the application at the recipient's location. A third responsibility of the transport layer is session management. Think of a session as a conversation between two computers. If you're going to have an ongoing conversation, you often establish a virtual circuit. This is also called connection oriented messaging. And it's what TCP uses. It's expecting messages to go back and forth for some period of time. So you establish a virtual connection and you keep that virtual circuit open while the connection is being pursued. And then you close the connection once you're finished. Sometimes you don't need to establish a virtual circuit. UDP uses connectionless messaging because it's assuming that you're sending one or two packets at a time and not establishing a long-term communication. When TCP establishes a connection, it uses a three-way handshake. It sends a synchronization request. The other side sends a synchronization acknowledgement. And then the first side sends an acknowledgement of the acknowledgement. This provides reliable end-to-end -end connections. Once you've established that you can talk to one another, you can send information accordingly. Let's transition to layer three, the network layer. One of the major functions of the network layer is addressing, or how we determine how to direct messages from a source to a destination. Addresses at the network layer have been assigned in various ways, in some cases by system administrators for local networks, by hardware vendors, or by the internet corporation for the large scale internet rollout of addresses. Addresses exist at different layers, but we're talking about the addresses at layer three. Addresses might be translated from one layer to another. So for instance, if you were trying to translate from an application layer, like a web browser to the network layer, you have to have some sort of connection between the IP address of a server and its URL, and DNS servers provide that translation. If you're trying to translate between an IP address and a specific hardware MAC address, you need to have a connection between the hardware and the IP address that it has been assigned. An address resolution protocol handles that translation. In IPv4, addresses are represented by four bytes or 32 bits.
the most common way to write down an IP address is four numbers separated by dots. And each of these numbers will range from 0 to 255, which is the maximum size in decimal of a 8-bit number. So we break it out into four 8-bit numbers, even though technically it is a 32-bit number. So you might have an address like 129, 79, 78, 193. We would write that down in binary as 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, and 8 bits. So it's a 32-bit address that we as humans interpret as four decimal numbers separated by dots. In most networks, part of the IP address represents the network where you reside, and the rest identifies the specific device. One version of this is classful addressing, where we use the first bits to determine the number of hosts, but we don't actually use this nomenclature very much. Classless interdomain routing uses subnet masks to allow more flexibility. So in the example on this slide, 129.79.78 would represent a specific network, and 193 would represent the specific device on that network. The subnet for this specific network would be 255, 255, 255, 0. The 255s represent that the first three sets of eight bits are reserved for the network. The zero represents that the last eight bits are reserved for individual devices on this network. Subnet masks can vary depending upon the size of your network. Let's take a look at what we do here in the Mays Business School at Texas A&M. If I go to a command prompt and type ipconfig, I can go look up my specific IP address on our network. And you can see here that my IP address for my computer in my office is 128.194.221.17. If I look at the subnet mask, it's 255.255.248.0, which is interesting. If it was 255.255.255.0, that would mean that 128, 194, and 221 were my local network, and 17 would be the specific device on that network. What does it mean when we see a 248? Well, if you change that number from 255 to 254, you would be freeing up one more bit for individual devices. So instead of allowing for 255 devices on a local network, you'd be allowing for 511. If we further change the subnet mask to 255, 255, 252, 0, we'd be freeing up the 10th bit for individual devices. So instead of having 511 devices, we'd have 1,023 possible devices. And finally, if we change the number from 252 to 248, we'd be freeing up yet one more bit, so not 8 or 9 or 10, but 11 bits, free for individual devices, which means we now could allow for 2,047 devices on one individual network. And that's what we've done here in Maze, is all of our various devices that are wired to the network are part of one large network, so our subnet mask is more available for individual devices and less available for the network space itself. On many networks, an IP address is assigned to a device when it connects to the network. Manually assigning an IP address to each device is time consuming, and it potentially uses up IP addresses that are not being commonly used by the particular device if the device is powered down or not currently in a particular location, like your laptop. So instead, we hand out IP addresses when they are needed, and this is called dynamic addressing. The most common way that we do this in modern networks is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. When a device tries to connect to a network, it sends out a broadcast message to the DHCP server. The DHCP server responds with a free IP address and the other IP settings. And then the device configures itself to use that particular IP address for some length of time, which is called leasing. Often a lease lasts something like 24 hours or seven days. And then the device loses its IP address and has to request for a renewal. If that same IP address is still free, which it probably is, the renewal process will just give you the same IP address again. But if it's not, you might potentially get a different IP address, and that's totally fine. There will be a server behind the scenes which connects your hardware address with your IP address. So when something is sent to a specific 
IP address. It will know which hardware device is currently using that address and will convey the message accordingly. This address resolution is handled using domain name services. So when you type something like a URL in your web browser, there are servers in the background that translate that URL to the specific IP address of the server. The IP address could be assigned to any particular server at any given moment in time, though most servers do have static IP addresses. The translation from an IP address to a MAC address is handled using address resolution protocol. So there's again a device somewhere on the network that knows that a specific hardware address is associated with a specific IP address and will direct a message to the specific piece of hardware that is currently using an IP address that is currently associated to a particular URL. Here's a diagram of how DNS might work. So in step one, you can see that the client sends a DNS request to a resolving name server. Step two sends a DNS request to the root server, which knows something more about how URLs and IP addresses are currently assigned that root server would send a response back to the resolving name server. That resolving name server would then send a DNS request to your top level domain server and receive a response. And then finally, the resolving name server may send a DNS request to the authoritative name server and receive a response. Now, not all these steps have to happen every single time. It is entirely possible that your client computer knows the IP address that's associated with a URL because it just used it milliseconds ago, in which case it might not send a DNS request. It'll just use the connection between the URL and the IP address that it already knows. It's possible that it might send a request to the resolving name server, and that local server knows the connection between the URL and the IP address and responds accordingly. It might be that the local name server doesn't know the particular URL IP connection and so it has to send off to the root server. If the root server doesn't know, you might have to send a top level domain. If the top level domain doesn't know, you might have to send to an authoritative name server. So this is an elevation of requests as necessary. If you don't have to elevate your request, you won't. If you or a server close to you knows the answer to the DNS request, you'll get the appropriate response from that device. This is a good place to pause. We will continue our discussion of chapter five in another video. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.